the last. Ouais, ça. Ouais, c'est parti. Ça flash. Ouais. On va attendre qu'Henri soit. There is a, a mic. Je sais pas. Je sais pas. Uh, okay. We can start. Yeah. All yeah. right. So, shall we start? So, thank you all for being here. So, welcome uh, today. Uh, thank you. <laughs> So today we're going to present you the usage, uh, the use of Blender uh, at Airbus uh, through various uh, use cases. Uh, so first, uh, let's, uh, let us introduce ourselves. So my name is uh, Henri Ebezen. I'm a freelance uh, CG artist and also a Blender trainer. And uh, I did a lot of uh, lighting, compositing, uh, and the stuff we're going to show you today. Yeah, hello, I'm Joel. I used to be an archivist uh, freelancer, and now I'm uh, working as an animator and especially as a layout artist. And I'm uh, also a member of RGBA Collective, as uh, Henri. <laughs> and, uh, I'm Alexandre Fraisse, and I'm working at uh, Airbus. Uh, well, basically, my job is to find, let's say, creative solutions to industrial problems. Uh, using 3D technologies. Uh, and so, okay, as you can see, that's not really a plane, because at Airbus we are doing actually much more than only planes. We are doing helicopters, jet fighters, drones, and spacecraft. And that's what we are here to talk about. And so, while well, we are doing various kinds of spacecraft, these are uh, telecommunication spacecraft with uh, big antennas. Uh, also, we have like, uh, scientific uh, spacecraft with different kind of payloads for cartography, uh, climate uh, uh, change, monitoring, and this kind of thing. Um, but we have kind of a little uh, problem with spacecraft regarding communication, I mean, because they are actually very hard to see in real life. Uh, because, well, first they are designed, and then even when they are manufactured and assembled, uh, we want to take very good care of them because uh, it's a nice piece of engineering. And so we, push, we put a lot and a lot of protections all around it, and so we actually never really see them. And because then it's placed on top of a rocket, and, uh, it's, and then it's sent into space, so we don't really have the opportunity to see it. That's actually not the right video. <laughs> No? Because hmm? up? Okay. Um, and so, yes, so, and once in space, it's uh, a real difficulty for us, of course, to, to uh, get any shot about it, as you can guess. So we heavily rely on, uh, well, CG renders. Uh, so well, I'm going to let you enjoy this uh, little guy going into orbit. Um, and so as you will see, we actually use only Blender to do all of this. So, well, um, the, th the thing is, just so, so you understand who we are exactly, uh, actually we are from the, actually I am from uh, an engineering background, so a few years ago, I began as a, me as a mechanical engineer, and my job was to design spacecraft in 3D using uh, CAD design. Uh, and so very frequently, I was asked to export my designs to uh, uh, an external company who then will uh, handle the, the, the render. Uh, as you can, I'm sure you probably know, uh, uh, from uh, an artist's perspective, working with uh, CAD uh, inputs, it's always a struggle because, well, it's uh, heavy models, are poorly tessellated and so on. But uh, believe me, from an engineer point of view, exporting these models is even worse. It's really terrible. So, um, so then, uh, the, this is due to the fact that uh, uh, this process is is kind of messy because, of course, it's all. Um, it's we have two different worlds actually. We have the engineering worlds with their own set of tools, with uh, CAD design, FEM simulations, and so on. And then, of course, there is the entertainment industry with uh, 3D gaming. Uh, I mean, animations and so on. 
Um, and the thing is, we don't really have any bridge between these two worlds. The, the two, they are, both of them are using 3D, they are using a lot of different tools, uh, but it's not, the community doesn't really talk to each other so much. Uh, but at the time, it was six or seven years ago, I actually used Bender at home as well. Uh, and so uh, I decided, well, what the hell, I can give it a try uh, because Blender is free, open source, and very easy to install. So I actually uh, take it to, onto my work computer, and then the next time that I was asked to export my, uh, my models, I did export the models, but as a bonus, I also gave them my render. Uh, well, it actually worked pretty well. The render was very compar competitive, comparative uh, to the external uh, uh, company ones, uh, but with only a fraction of the, of the cost, because actually I, I managed the entire process. I mean, I really streamlined everything, because I knew exactly where to put the, to put the light, to have a physically correct illumination. Uh, I knew where will be the materials, the different kind of materials, and I especially knew how to import uh, what to export from uh, the CAD software and what I should model directly into Blender. And so this was uh, a real breakthrough for us. And so that was yeah, um, a nice, uh, nice achievement. And so from this, we actually ha had a lot and a lot of, uh, of new demands for renderings. And so actually right now we have a little uh, in-house uh, studio production using Blender to illustrate our products. And so, um, may, so now we are yeah, illustrating a little bit all of our, uh, our spacecraft projects. And sometimes we have uh, some ex exotic uh, demands, and this is one of them. Uh, the, we had the opportunity, actually, to illustrate a, a transformation project, which uh, deals with the digitalization that is going on at Airbus. So how new technologies will uh, help people to do their work more efficiently and more safely in a nice environment. And so, well, I'm going to let uh, Joel tell you more about it. So this was the biggest project that our small team do. And it was a five minute fi uh, film, full CG. Uh, and it was, um, we started um, for the artist uh, team uh, one year and a half ago. Um, we, the, the goal of this movie was to show how the, the manufacturers uh, will produce satellites in the next three to five years. So it's in the future, but the near future. And the leaders of this manufacturing a team, I want also to inspire that team and make uh, them proud of their work. So, um, to start this project, um, they are the world of the engineers and the world of the artists, and the two worlds are so different, so we um, had to, um, to have um, several meetings to share our knowledge. So engineers teach us how satellites are, are made and the artist team um, learn them to how to make a movie. And it was very rich so we can understand each other. And so next slide is a, a teaser of the movie. So if we can. So as I said, uh, it was the biggest project uh, to date for a small team. We, are we were four artists, CG artists, 
now the team has grown and we are six artists and six developers so it was very, very bigger it was a uh, it it is a five minute full cg uh, movie with a lot of characters um, the teams want the the manufacturing team the our client want uh, to show that in the future um, people will produce and uh, make satellites too it's not all robotic so there are people in the movies and we want to also to show um, real satellites so it's real realistic environment environment and realistic uh, satellites but the characters are on, um, low poly and non realistic because we have don't we don't have the time to animate real persons um, the other um, challenge in this project was to um, uh, to show to explain very technical points um, in a short time in five minutes and a lot of innovations and a lot of technical points and it will be it will it was a, a big challenge to condense that in five minutes um, and before the, uh, we start the project in the artist side the manufacturing team has prepared the, this project for a long time and they, they do a really good job so we we had a, um, like a storyboard but not a movie storyboard but a storyboard with all the innovation and all the steps of the movie but we need to improve that with the, with our skills of artist and storyboard artist and etc so we put it in a real storyboard uh, we, we make it with uh, all our team and we make it as a collaborative directors we were five people and we in the meetings we are exchanging ideas and live storyboarding and it was uh, really pleasing to do that uh, together um, so now I will show you a quick view of our project. So, in on top uh, left, uh, there is a storyboard um, that we, we 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 do in the, this meeting, and Guillaume uh, done that uh, in live. So it's uh, very impressive to see and. Um, Next, there is a um, our 2D animatic. I made it with uh, based on the storyboard and with a grease pencil. I can I could um, improve this and make it more readable with uh, colors and animatic animating some movement to be more um, more uh, to to. Um, uh, to, to do the timings um, after that we get um, about f four minutes movie and then the two dimension is cool but we want to be in three dimension so I I make uh, also a 3d layout and I so I model extra ultra low poly uh, models in the bottom left and um, we need that because the huge scale of satellites and the huge scale of um, room um, of uh, manufacturing rooms and with people it was difficult to to um, make the, the shots uh, fine so we need this uh, 3d layout and i use um, the blender render to get also the lighting in the opengl uh, viewport it's, um, I use also uh, some uh, grease pencil to add some improv improvement on the on the image, and after that we add the voice that explains every um, innovations, and with the amount of ex explanations the movies go to uh, I up. Uh, the movie gain one minute and. Then it's uh, uh, five-minute uh, movies. 
Um, after the layout uh, finished, we go to the animation. We don't have any pictures of animation, but you can see the final uh, render at the bottom right. And after the animation, we made with two people, the lighting team of, this was uh, Henry, uh, lighting team. and Guillaume. <laughs> <laughs> and so he will talk uh, about lighting. Yeah. Thanks. So um, there are a few challenge, challenges about the lighting. Uh, uh, so the, the environment has to, had to be uh, photorealistic, so because the, the real star of the movie actually are the innovation uh, that we see in the clean rooms. So um, that's what we want to, to emphasize and to, to put in light. So uh, and they, of course they want it to be uh, photorealistic, uh, perfect. So uh, we use uh, Cycles as our render engine. And uh, the second challenge was that uh, the movie uh, has uh, many shots. It's like uh, 50 shots in five minutes. So um, I had to spend less than one day uh, per shot to light. So I had to be really, really fast. But the, um, the good news was that uh, uh, most of the movie uh, takes place in, uh, in this kind of environment. So it's uh, a clean room. So it's a room where there is no dust at all. Uh, and. Uh, uh, all the clean rooms are, uh, looks like uh, each other, so it's uh, it's quite easy. So what I what I did what I did is um, that I just uh, created um, uh, a reference lighting that I copy and paste uh, in all my scenes, so I could be really really fast. And uh, we had to use um, uh, small um, tips to get our lighting correct because. Um, uh, these are quite big uh, scales uh, scenes. Uh, so as you can see, if you see the um, the, the size of a, of a character in a, in this room, uh, you can see that um, yeah, it's a big closed room, and uh, it's not the ideal case for cycles because the closed room and big closed room uh, generate a lot of noise. So we had to find some uh, tips to to get rid of the noise. Uh, so what we did is that even if the, if it looks like we are in a closed room, uh, we did like uh, everybody does uh, in the cinema. So uh, we just uh, opened the room, so it's uh, it's uh, really easier. So we just uh, build uh, like a set. We just build the world that we need. And uh, another uh, issue that we had uh, is that uh, from in the real world, the, the lighting in the in this clean room comes from these big spots like there. So our first idea was to do, um, okay, uh, we are using cycles, it's photorealistic, so ju let's just replicate what is in uh, real life and uh, 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 put some uh, powerful uh, lamps in, this, uh, in these places. And it's a really, really bad idea. Uh, because the, So we've got a big scene and uh, these tiny little lamps in the scale of the scene, and this generate a lot of, lo uh, a lot of noise, a lot of fireflies, because uh, uh, we can see it a little. Uh, all the, um, almost all the surfaces of the sets are reflective, so you've got uh, bounces of light, and it's, it's quite a nightmare to, to render. So uh, we did, uh, like everybody uh, does, that uh, we cheated. <laughs> so uh, actually, uh, this, this lamp uh, doesn't uh, really emit light, and uh, we use uh, aerial lights uh, all, all of the place. So really, like a, like a cinema lighting. So it was a. a Quite, uh, quite useful. Uh, and, and then, uh, with this technique, we, we went, on, went, went on and just uh, build uh, all, the, all the lighting. Uh, so as you can see in this split screen, the, um, we have a coherent lighting uh, on all the, of the movie, because uh, once he worked uh, for one scene, I just had basically to copy and paste my lights, move a, few, uh, a little light just uh, to, to adapt it to the shot, and, uh, and it was all right. Uh, it's an, another example, so this one is uh, it's a little bit different, but it's kind of the, the same principle. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it's supposed to be a tiny room, closed room, uh, almost dark, but behind this, this people there are no walls at all, so I could, uh, put the, I could allow the light to, to enter and get rid of the noise uh, quite, uh, quite easily. Uh, same for this one, so we illustrate uh, several in innovations. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the file management. So we are we work like a small studio, so we have a fairly uh, standard pipeline, and um, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't use uh, only free, uh, free software on our pipeline yet. Uh, so um, we have uh, the beginning of our workflow. Uh, uh, almost uh, every, um, well, all the 3D part on rendering, of course, is done in Blender. So uh, we render our files. Uh, we save our rendering files in uh, EXR, and then we do a first pass of uh, compositing uh, in a separate blend file. Uh, so this way, we can uh, enjoy all the. Um, well, we, we enjoy the. We can reconstruct our images with paths and layers and stuff like that, and uh, we can still use uh, the advantage when you render in EXR. Uh, it's like for your color management. Um, all the color information is not stored uh, in the in the EXR, so you you get uh, out of the rendering file, you get uh, only a raw data from your render engine, and then uh, you don't lose anything uh, when you uh, reload the EXR in a separate file, and you can do all your color, color management um, like that. Uh, and uh, when we have, uh, when uh, we have finished this compositing file, uh, this time we switch to a, classi a more classical uh, sRGB pipeline. So you can, we can uh, go to uh, After Effects and Premiere and do our final adjustments. Um, we would like to to keep EXR at this point, but unfortunately, After Effects is really really bad uh, with EXRs. Uh, so he has in his own way of handling EXRs, and uh, he doesn't use the open color, um, open color IO uh, stuff uh, that is fairly standard in the industry. So uh, we can't get, uh, if we export uh, EXRs, uh, uh, composite images uh, from Blender with uh, EXRs, and uh, we apply the same color management uh, after that in After Effects, we couldn't get a uh, one-to-one -one, uh, image. So we had uh, darker images or lighter or stuff like that. So that's why we decided to uh, output PNGs from, uh, from Blend and uh, then uh, go back to a more traditional uh, RGB uh, pipeline. But uh, if somebody here in the audience uh, have got, um, has got some uh, ideas or tips to uh, get a, a more uh, color managed uh, pipeline from the beginning to the end, uh, I'm really uh, eager to, to hear your ideas. Um, so, so more images from the final renders, and uh, then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's coming up next in our in our small studios. Mm. So, yeah, thanks. So um, yes, once again we are doing more and more renders. Uh, it can be still pictures or uh, animations. But more importantly, we are also uh, well uh, moving along with uh, with the real-time uh, technology. So we are beginning to work with uh, AR and VR, not necessarily always with Blender, but uh, still Blender is really at the core of our 3D pipeline, even for these kind of applications. And um, and also uh, some I can tell you just a little bit about uh, another application that we do with Blender is uh, how we use Blender to. Uh, perform some kind of uh, analysis uh, from an engineering point of view and especially regarding uh, shadowing problems because on space of course uh, shadows are actually very very important uh, for instance you can have the, 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 the spacecraft body that can cast a shadow onto its uh, solar panels uh, and so this, of course, uh, you need to handle because, because the onboard power will uh, uh, fluctuate. Uh, and also, we, for a thermal point of view, uh, shadows are quite critical because um, you can have, uh, if a part, if an equipment is directly lit by, uh, by the sun, then uh, it's got quite a good amount of energy, so it's uh, quite hot. But then as soon as it is uh, into the shadow, then you don't need to see cold space, and then it gets very, very cold. And since you don't have any atmosphere or any air to like homogenize all this temperature uh, difference, well, sometimes you can end up with uh, some difficulties. And so we are using Blender, so this is just a still image. I cannot show you so, so much more, but uh, we are using Blender to, to do this kind of, uh, of shadow analysis and see how the shadows are shifting from one place of the spacecraft to another, depending on the um, orbital position and the sun inclination and so on. So, yeah, maybe you can tell us more yeah. about Blender now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and from a Blender point of view, or more technical point of view, um, we are really, really excited about uh, EV, like uh, everybody else, I think. Uh, so it will, um, 
we are quite excited because um, we still we already used like uh, the PBR shaders, and now we are moving our shaders to the new principal shader in Blender. So uh, it should be uh, like uh, um, a switch, really easy uh, when EV will be ready because uh, our material uh, should be uh, compatible automatic uh, automatically. So um, it will save us a lot of lot of time, uh, our rendering time. Um, let's talk a little bit about GLTF. Uh, so um, how many of you uh, have heard about uh, GLTF 2.0? Uh, nice, a few hands. So uh, for those who doesn't uh, know it, so um, GLTF 2.0 is, um, is a new uh, file format, an open uh, standard uh, for file format. So uh, because file format, uh, you know, in 3D is quite complicated. So actually, we, we rely uh, a lot uh, on uh, FBX to do our exchange with other, um, uh, other 3D applications. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of problems with FBX because it's, uh, it's an Autodex format and uh, it works um, not really well with Blender. Uh, so we are really excited about GLTF, which is uh, not supposed to replace uh, FBX, but can solve a lot of problems in uh, many situations, especially for real-time application. GLTF is really uh, a runtime uh, file format, so it's optimized for uh, loading files, uh, 3D files, really, really fast. So it's really interesting if you're doing if you're doing VR, AR, or WebGL stuff. Um, so it's a really young format, but really easy to implement and to understand. So um, uh, yeah, we are really. Um, uh, happy uh, that it's starting to to get uh, more and more interest in the industry. It's an industry supported like with big names like Microsoft, Microsoft is behind GLTF, uh, Google, and a lot of big companies like that. So um, if you are looking for a good format, take a look at GLTF and use it in your project. It's, uh, it's going to be great. And uh, yeah, we really believe that, uh, of course, real time is, is the future, and uh, we, we are getting more and more uh, stuff in real time. So we will do more uh, VR stuff, more ER stuff. Uh, it really adds a lot of. Uh, it had a, a lot of potential for for engineering stuff, not only marketing and communication, but really engineering. It, it can helps. Um, it can solve a lot of problems uh, from from today. So uh, we really believe in in, um, in, in this stuff. And uh, so um, uh, Herbus is really protective with its IPs, but we managed to uh, find a way to uh, share with you uh, some of our scripts we use to help us in production. Uh, so uh, if you go on, the, um, on my GitHub, uh, you will find a few uh, scripts that can help you, especially if, you, um, if you're using uh, CAD files, uh, imported CAD files, and you work on really heavy, heavy models. Um, this this one here uh, can uh, can help you uh, a lot. So there are a few tools like to uh, uh, mm, to select uh, all the all the screw, for for example, in one click uh, in all your models. Uh, you can search by name. You can search by uh, partial names. You can uh, merge materials, uh, delete materials, so, um, this kind of stuff. So if you if you used to work with CAD um, CAD uh, imported models, you know that they are re really dirty when you when you load them in in Blender. So uh, we we use these tools to help us and to instead of uh, spending uh, days uh, cleaning the model, we just spend hours. So it's uh, a little better. Uh, this one is uh, a little bit more um, motion graphics uh, oriented. So it's just a tool to help the artist. If you want to uh, generate a lot of uh, moving curves, uh, you just have to draw one uh, Bezier curve in your, um, in your viewport, and it will generate thousands and thousands of curves uh, that will move along uh, the, the guide curve. So it's uh, really for our motion graphics needs. And uh, the last one is, uh, is less Blender-oriented, but uh, it's for uh, people who have uh, troubles uh, with uh, FBX, who can't uh, open FBX in Blender. Uh, so we wrote a tool that is based on the Autodesk FBX um, SDK, and um, that can solve a few problems. So if you have uh, any problems, for example, if you have um, an uh, FBX which is binary that Blender cannot open, uh, this tool can uh, open the, the, the FBX and just output uh, an, an ASCII uh, FBX that Blender can uh, load, so uh, it can, uh, can be quite, quite useful. Um, 
so the movie we presented to you will be available uh, hopefully in November on YouTube. Uh, but um, if we have uh, a few minutes uh, more, as there is no presentation after all, uh, we can share it to you. Uh, we, we got the authorization from Airbus to, to show it to you. Uh, so uh, it's a five minutes, so if you want to watch it, uh, we can watch it now. At an altitude of 36,000 kilometers, cruising for over 15 years, our spacecraft provides global services for mankind. In a future driven by innovation and communications, the need for efficient data... <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> And that's a fail. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um. All right. So if you want to to see it, maybe we, we you can go see us, and we will show you on our our, our computers, and. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>